But I will read out his very entertaining uh, email that he says. First, he said he was very much looking forward to being uh, to have a discussion with the brilliant panelists Lisa Schiff <laughs> and Klaus uh, and and able moderation of me. Uh, I was walking happily in a design district in Miami just over a week ago when I saw a graffiti wall with the message "Do what you love." I had to immediately photograph it! Exclamation mark. While looking for my phone, I did not look where I was walking. I did not see unevenness in the pavement, tripped and managed to tear the ligaments of my knee. The moral of the story is, first look where you walk and only then do what you love. <laughs> so there we go. He'll be with us in spirit, Simon. Um, just to, but before we sort of are, are more of a discussion, I just want to take it to contextualize what we're going to be talking about. I think the whole, the, the, the world of art advisory and where we are is becoming of crucial importance more today than ever. Um, as we all know, the art world is a scary and uh, mysterious place, and it's getting more and more difficult to navigate, I think, as it gets more complicated, as it gets more global, and people are sort of, you know, scrambling to find out what they really should be doing, how they should be buying, what exactly to navigate through, through all of that as well. I think as well, as new collectors come in, um, younger collectors who, are, who, you know, who are, have, have money these days, um, needing more advice than ever. And there's also a lot of people who are vying to provide that advice, uh, who are probably, you know, sort of competing with the art advisory role, whether they're the auction houses, whether they're the galleries themselves, um, financial institutions. Um, there's a lot of people trying to sort of be the, the person who is the go-to guide for, these, for the new collectors. Um, and I think uh, the, the, the art world being, uh, the art market being unregulated, as we know, which is always a very interesting issue, um, someone like an art advisor is, uh, is a role that is unregulated. So which is very uh, different than something like the real estate industry or the financial services industry where people who are advising uh, will be regulated by a regulatory body, have set contracts that they have to do, set regulatory rules, where art advisory in the art world is, a, is kind of the Wild West, not that you're the cowboy Wild West, but, but it, it doesn't have that degree of regulation. Uh, so I think... It'll be interesting today to sort of unpick what that role is exactly, where it's going, and how it relates to um, to galleries, to artists, and how you know, the, the, as we say, we could all work together as well. So to begin with, I think it'd be interesting just to talk about, from each of your perspectives, what your view is. What is an art advisor? What what is the role of art advisor? And also, what kind of background? I know you have a PhD in art history. Is that something that is essential? Is, is there a sort of prerequisite of what you think an art an advisor should be? But what is that role, really, basically? Do you want to start off, Lisa? I mean, I, it's, I've been doing this now almost 16 years. And I think over time, I've really understood what it is. Because when I started, I really did had no idea there was no real roadmap. And there were not that many art advisors as there are now. But I think what I've learned is that it's really about making the art world transparent and just what you said, helping people navigate all the different personalities and characters and everything and educate them. I think in terms of what kind of background, for a while I was like, God, I wish I had an MBA because you know, I have a lot of financial clients. But the truth is, I think the best thing that I could have done was, and I'd, as much as I'd love to say that I am Dr. Schiff, I am ABD on my PhD. But I did do a lot of, some, which means you, you're all but dissertation, so you advance to candidacy. So I spent a lot of time doing doctoral work, and I taught at the university. And I think probably the biggest crisis we're in right now is lack of any historical knowledge or relevancy, and I really fight to preserve that. So I do think it's really important to have some art history background. Mm, okay. Uh, and uh, Cl both Klaus and David, I mean, you've been in as ga acting as galleries for many years. Is, it, is this a new role, and has it has actually changed in your in your sort of lifetimes as galleries as well? well Klaus, I, I, is, is this working? It doesn't sound like it is. No, I can't hear. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, here we go. Yeah. So, uh, I am very much opposed to the. Um, this phenomenon, which to me is feels very new. Um, it could be very efficient, and there are a few art advisors, in my experience, that do their job. But very, very few are uh, of the quality that we would want us 
ones or have. I, I mean, to my experience, it's somebody who went through the course at either Christie's and or Sotheby's so and why is that a good a, course? I feel like that's the and uh, right. probably was hired by a gallery and kicked out of a gallery and started on their own. And there is, I mean, this lack of <laughs> code of, out, of conduct that uh, there seems to be uh, in your world uh, is deplorable, I think. I think it's the same in the gallery. No. No. I mean, we're, it's, it's we're immediately getting into controversy. No, I mean, listen, it. it's it's the gallery it's creates artists. Artists create artists. That's true, but the gallery. Listen, there's deplorable people. There's deplorable artists. There's deplorable gallerists. There's deplor deplorable people everywhere. But there are also upstanding people. So I don't think it's fair to just make a derogatory statement of we're all kicked out of galleries, so we go into business for ourselves. Mm. I wasn't kicked out of a gallery. What, what is what? What particularly is deplorable? Can you sort of define what what sort of behavior do you find that is objectionable? So let me. Le, uh, so, in Miami, yeah, uh, last month, um, we have a very. I mean, the, the art advisors are only interested in the in the uh, work which is m most sellable, and that's the biggest uh, uh, attraction from the audience. So the art advisor comes and uh, puts a hold on a piece huh? because he, wa he or she wants to speak to their client and try to... Um, and this, this uh, procedure uh, stretches suddenly over a long time. Suddenly the piece is on hold for a so long time that I lose the other client in respect for this... Uh, this uh, um, this advisor with, with whom we have done uh, work before. And this happens all the time. Is that a particular thing about an advisor, or is it collectors just will be doing the same thing? No, clients is a different thing. Right. Clients, you say, you want it or you don't want it. And they, des they decide. OK. David, I'll bring you into this <laughs> as well. Uh, and in your experience, I mean, you know, have you seen the, the role of art advisors growing Differing, yeah, yes, changing. I think even uh, from time memorial, I mean, certainly when I first started in, in 67, there were already uh, advisors. They were uh, called um, runners, uh, and it was had a slightly different role. And I think things have evolved now through, through the modern technology and everything else that advisors have a, a role. And uh, I think it's important as a gallerist to ac accept that they have a role. But I think as they have a role, they also have a responsibility. And um, just as a gallery should have a responsibility to the artist and also to the client, so, so should um, art advisors. And I think there are a number of extremely good advisors who do their research and also um, uh, do their work properly and, and, and have a correct procedure with the gallerist and so on. And, and they're extremely helpful and very, very good. Unfortunately, as, as Klaus has intimate, intimated, that there are a number who are just, um, in a way, becoming like, like go-betweens. And uh, I can get... I. I know this client, I, I know the gallery knows this client as well, but uh, I can get a wedge in here. But I mean, this happens also with other galleries as well. So in fairness to art advisors, it's not just them. What we're really talking about here, I think, is a code of conduct. And a code of conduct, we as galleries are more and more getting involved in code of conduct. Mm. Um, because the sums involved are enormous, and we should be. Uh, but I think likewise, I mean, there should be a, um, I don't know, is there an advisors association? There is. And, and, and do you discuss things like that? I'm not part of it. You're, you're, were you kicked out of that as well? No, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Why are you not part of it? I have never 
found it relevant. But I think, I mean, I think, I think that's what's interesting, and that's the thing I was going to talk about as well, and, I, and I mentioned this sort of unregulated nature of, of, of the role of the art advisor, and, that, and that's, you know, it's like the rest of the art is world. The is the gallerist regulated? Well, exactly, that's what I'm saying. The, the, it's, it's the rest it's of the industry is unregulated, but, it, but is it self-regulated? But wait, when you talk about regulation, you're yeah. talking about finances. Like, we have to understand we're talking about also art history here. Yeah. So how am I regulating that? Sorry. No, no, uh, absolutely. Yeah. But I think what I'm saying is, that, uh, like most things in the art in the art market that is completely unregulated, uh, is it is there a self-regulation that goes on? You know, as you were saying, if there's bad behavior, isn't there some sort of internal punishment that goes on um, that maybe you won't deal with that advisor again? I mean, it's, it's not no, like course, it's sort of, of you know, th there aren't repercussions for to acting in a in a negative way. I mean, you you have to be have a reputation about you as you do. Yeah, or you wouldn't be able to buy anything. Exactly. <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there I we are. I mean, I don't want to <laughs> be convincing people that they should like <laughs> art advisors or have art advisors. But if you have questions about how it works, I can answer that. Also, in terms of from a gallery's perspective, is that it's not in a, in a way um, the art advisor doing a service in a way of bringing new clients, of bringing new types of clients that maybe wouldn't step through the door if it hadn't been for you know coming from a different angle. Do you see that? No, that's what Happening we as well. hope for. That's the service <laughs> that we would hope for. But uh, um, th I mean, I think I think that the, there are two ways that I have experienced this service of the art advisor, and that is, and and the uh, one of the most difficult things is that, in my experience, <laughs> many of the advisors ask commissions not only from the client w for whom they're supposedly working, but also from the gallery. And I think that's absolutely where the roads <laughs> divide. If you ask a commission from the gallery, then you're not doing, I mean, everybody knows that the service, if you do something for somebody, <laughs> it, should co it, it should be, uh, uh, and so the client, the original client, is the one who is supposed to pay for this service. Uh, do you agree to that? I mean, I think what you're talking about is criminal, and it's disgusting behavior. But I, I think that's not the advisors that I work with or what I do, but I'm sure there are many of them. What, what mm. is, I mean, Lisa, what is, what is your business model? I mean, how, how does that, how would you think that... I mean, I've been working with the same collectors for 15 years. Mm. Um, you know, you talk about competition because there's all these new advisors coming out. And the truth is, A, there's not that many really good ones or really educated ones. Um, and B, you can only have so many clients. Mm. I, I can't just pile on clients. Like, it has to be a really good person who really wants an advisor. I get phone calls all day long for from people who appear to be really normal adults but who think I have special access and that you know I could be hired to like get access, and I don't have access at all. The client has access. I'm just there representing on their behalf. Um, so I work with my collectors. We work on building their collections. Everybody's very different in what they want. Some people have their own contacts with galleries, and then I just get called in to discuss it and help make decisions and then negotiate at the final hour. Some of my clients don't know anything about art, so I start little by little trying to help them. I mean, I think some of the hard things about advising that you could fall into is building your collection, you know, like kind of finding some galleries that you're really close with and artists that you really love and just kind of building the same collection over and over again. And I, I work really hard not to do that or not to impose my own taste, but to really try to figure out what a client is, what their aesthetic interests are, and then sort of expose them, like, okay, if you like this, then maybe look at this also, you know, and just go across the board and let them sort of find it. It's not about me selling to them in that way. I also found over time um, that my client is the collector, not the gallery, because I've been very manipulated by galleries many times to try to push their agenda onto my clients. And so I, I really have to play Geneva because I love galleries. 
I find them more and more important as we're losing some kind of filter into good taste. And, and, and I hate even using that word, but I don't know how else to say it. I do, I do really quite believe in historical relevancy. And if you don't have any kind of content, if I'm just doing an art fair off of Instagram, then you know, we're in trouble. So I do find the role of the gallery mm. really important, and I, it's important to me. But I'm very careful with how I how close I get to gallerists. I'm very aware of their needing to make sales. Yesterday, I think we were talking about having a sales quota um, at some of the mega galleries. When you have 20 salespeople, it's really dangerous. Um, so I think I'm actually protecting a lot of collectors from gallerists. <laughs> oh, kidok, Klaus. But you don't do any <laughs> exhibitions, do you? It's not my job. Mm. Is is there an issue bringing a, a a client to a gallery of, you know, potentially losing that client and the gallery sort of taking over that? Does that has that happened, or is well that? Well, I don't that own that their issue? relationships, and I have mm. no interest in owning their relationships. And I usually ask people off the bat, do you want to ha be the primary contact? Do you want to negotiate? Do you want to get to know everybody, or do you want to be buffered and private? And it's completely up to them. I mean, my one of my best clients is, you know, in, who didn't know anything about the art world is very close with a lot of different gallerists now, and I'm very happy for that. And your re your financial relationship is, is it a retainer, or how, how does that work? It That's depends on the. Much. It depends on the collector. Yeah. Either way, it kind of averages out to a percentage. <laughs> Um, some people are more comfortable with a retainer. I think retainer is the best model, just for kind of regulation, if you will. Transparency. Yeah. Well, also, it's really hard. I mean, for me to be on top of the global art world, I have to be on an airplane 24-7. I have to pay staff, you know, and having a retainer is great because then you're getting a constant feed. But I think the issue is a lot of people, you know, not everybody's building a museum. And people are like, well, I'm not going to spend that much, you know. So they'd prefer to keep it on a commission basis. But if we are on a commission basis, we are on 100% exclusivity in a contract. So even if you're on vacation in St. Bart and you want to buy something, I might waive my fee, but I've got to transact it. I've got to be part of the conversation. I think what's really interesting, and I'm going to bring Simon back into this conversation, as if he's here, uh, is is this idea of a, um, a contractual relationship with the client or whatever sort of agreement you have with the client. Because Simon just won, and his wife just won a big judgment, eight-figure judgment. I'm not going to say the number, but it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's public, I know, exactly. But, you know, be discreet about his money as well. Um, uh, which, which, where the High Court in the UK upheld what was called the gentleman's agreement that he had with, uh, with the person he was sort of de dealing with, um, sort of facilitating a, a very big sale of that big, big goga. So the idea that um, this sort of word of mouth thing was upheld and sort of was, w so the idea of, of not necessarily having to have a contract, which kind of is very interesting. I think it sort of legitimizes the sort of fluid nature of how the art world works in some way, or? Well, I think in that instance, he was acting as a dealer. Yeah. And I think there's confusion, or maybe it's just a slippery slope between advising and dealing. Yeah, yes, I think so as well. I, I think um, what's, What's interesting is not, um, obviously, you're a very well-known um, art, art advisor and you're very well organized and you have um, staff and people and uh, so you're putting in a lot for the client. Um, likewise, what Klaus is talking about is that the gallery is putting in an enormous amount for the artist and uh, involves for the gallery years and years of building up things, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, where things go wrong is with people who call themselves art advisors. And, you know, they just happen to know a couple of friends who have some money or mm. collectors, and, and, and then they just basically are in for a wedge, for a bit of the money, so to speak. And that, I think, is the problem. And the problem, and, and it's, qu it's, it's quite extreme. Uh, and I think that's why a lot of galleries get upset. You know, you can be at an art fair talking to a collector and somebody will barge in and be an, an, an art advisor and will screw the deal to go somewhere else or vice versa or another. 
galleries do the same. I mean, we have a lot of galleries that don't behave correctly either. But what we really need is not, not mass regularization, but we need to have some kind of a code of conduct mm. that if art advisors don't behave correctly, there's some form of maybe not working mm, with mm. them and vice versa also for galleries as well. I mean, just as galleries, you know, if we know that there are galleries who don't pay their artists, we need to uh, work on that. And I think... I don't uh, think there's any the way to... The market is coming that way. I don't think you can regulate that way. I mean, the organization that exists for art advisors is full of probably many of these misbehaving advisors. Right. But I also feel like it's, it's just... I wouldn't have any clients anymore. You know, I have... Like, it's if, if I'm not transparent, if I'm not honest, and if I'm not doing a really good job, you know, then I would be out of business. So hopefully... <laughs> It just doesn't, I mean, it seems so obvious to me when there's somebody who's just completely useless and knows nothing. And if somebody's happy with that kind of work, I mean. Well, I think there's, there's no, no question here. Um, th uh, hopefully we're not talking about ourselves, we're talking <laughs> about other people. And I think what we really are to should be talking about is the other people, the galleries who misbehave, the artists, art advisors who misbehave. And there must be some kind of a form, you know, and something that can be done. I mean, I think... I, know, don't, I, uh, I think, I, I th I think I agree with Lisa. I think it's repu like the whole it's industry is reputation-based. And, and, and almost and this conversation is kind of silly. It's like, you know, there's horrible collectors. Horrible collectors. I mean, I don't even want to call them collectors. There's just people speculating everywhere. Um, so there's all kinds of bad behavior. It's all over the art world. It's kind of what makes it funny sometimes. I think the more interesting thing is like to talk about what advisors, not like how can you police them, because I, I think you have to police yourself. Um, but you know, what do, how can we function? Like, how do we work with galleries? How can we help artists better? How do we, you know, work for collectors? And you know, it's a, it's a really, it's a really hard time I think for galleries. I think, you know, this is the thing I come across a lot. So. You know, it used to be, and I've watched it change too, because, I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years, but there would be one gallery in L.A. that had, you know, this artist, this artist, and this artist. And that's where I went for those artists. All of a sudden, there's 20 galleries, you know. And I remember this one day, one of I was very close to a gallerist who had X artist. And then that artist had a show in New York, where I live. And I was like, this is an amazing show. I want to get this piece for my client. And the, as if I had betrayed this person so badly for going to another gallery, now it's almost impossible to like even see straight. There's so much, there's so much stuff coming all the time. Um, but there's, I think, I think so when I go into a gallery sometimes, we get this, um, well, your client's not, you know, supporting the rest of the program. You know, just because I'm an advisor doesn't mean... I'm coming in and saying, I only want your best stuff. You know, but I've sat down and I will go through and decide what I like. I don't look for market artists. And I have, I mean, I have collectors that tend to buy your blue chip um, artists. And I have collectors who could care less and are looking for specific things that fit their collection. So I tend to buy across the board in a lot of galleries, which has been very helpful. But I also think it's a huge disservice to an artist, and I see this all the time, um, where artist you know, X, who's so famous, is sold if those five artists are purchased also, which is a horrible thing for those artists because then that collector is just going to want to sell all of it because they didn't want it in the first place. So you know, it's kind of all of these different kind of pressures that are going on it, and it could go, I, I, there's bad behavior on both sides. But I think, um, I think the pressure right now of galleries shifting scale, small, medium, large, you know, working with a large gallery as an advisor is like a landmine, you know, because it's take, it takes a long time to figure out how to get around the fact that when you walk in the door, somebody basically calls you as theirs. Mm. That's it. You're that salesperson's thing. And so the truth is you really need to work with 10 different people at some of these larger galleries or the owner only mm -hmm. because you won't be able to get a straight answer about anything. 
or get access to what you're looking for. I hate to use the word access, but even, you know, it's like there's so much infighting and politics happening on the inside of some of these larger galleries um, that that's been really helpful to understand that and to be able to explain that to a collector, you know, so they understand, um, you know, what's going on. Mm. And it, just to, to carry on what we talked about, is one of the benefits of, the many benefits of having an art advisor on the scene, um, acting as a filter in a way for galleries? I mean, are you sort of saying, you know, I'm not going to take people who are speculators on, so the people I'm representing or helping are, are going to have the right motivations and that sort of helps in Listen, terms of the thing? I have done everything wrong at some point, and it's been really, I mean, I've, I took on a collector years ago who was a young MTV guy, and I thought, oh, this is so exciting. I've got a young client. You know, I had, I started with a, a really small group of um, collectors from Boston, and they, they're so lovely and amazing, but, you know, you have to continue to grow and, you know, not put all your eggs in one basket, so I got this young guy from L.A., completely bamboozled me, was was planning on, you know, using me to buy things and then, you know, and it, it I fired him after six months. Um, but, you know, you, it's so you start to learn to see this kind of, mm, you mm. can sort of read between the lines. Like, mm. I mean, it's really obvious. It's just, that was my first time, so I didn't realize that was happening. Also, speculation is relatively new. Mm. You know, it's, and even without speculation, you know, when I'm interviewing clients, like there are certain cities in particular where you just, ne if they all buy the same things. They just want what their neighbors have. And so I try not to kind of get into that trendy, you know, it's boring. I don't, you know, like I can't be selling art. And that's like, if I'm just trying to sell to make a commission or to make money, I won't have any clients. So I really have to build great collections and that means taking a long time for people to find something. I mean, the art fair thing, and I try to tell my clients not to buy at fairs and just take it as a research. The, the amount of art that people are presented every day, all day long, is so insane. You're just supposed to keep buying and buying and buying and buying. If you're a good collector, and I work for a lot of them, we are offered things all day long. And if we don't keep going, well, you're not supporting the gallery. You know, I just, it just, you know, the, there's, there has to be a, a limit. Mm. What about, the, and we're talking about artists themselves, what about direct connections between art advisors and the artists? Is there that? Or uh, how does the gallery feel about art advisors having that sort of relationship? Well, there are a few artists who do work rather with agents, and I, uh, I would also like to question that because uh, the, the uh, of course it depends on the quality of the work that the agent does and there are some very efficient agents uh, comparable to these uh, uh, very few efficient and uh, reputable uh, art advisors uh, <coughs> but i th in this audience <laughs> yeah in this audience i'm sh uh, which are mainly art dealers or galleries I'm sure that everybody has this ex experience that I have, uh, that we have been um, had m um, major uh, <laughs> problems with uh, art advisors, and that's something that, I mean, code of conduct is not regulation; it's a suggestion of how one should um, um, handle problems when they come up or, or and and I think that's uh, as well as for galleries that's a very important uh, thing in, in this case but I want to move on as well because the role of art advisor I think is, is going beyond just you as a classic art advisor and I think it's particularly things like the auction houses seem to be moving God uh, bless don't go Alan there. <laughs> moving into the art advisory. Does that work? How is that, how is that happening? I mean Do they advise, are they taking your role as an art advisor in-house into, into the auction? I mean, I think banks are doing it. And, you know, I don't know. I don't find this threatening at all. First of all, I have to say, I'm so excited about AAP. Yeah. This is, like, amazing. This is Art Agency Partners, which, which has been acquired by yeah. Sotheby's. I mean, this is really important for the industry of art advisory because we need a model. And, you know, Thea Westreich was really the only 
model, but it wasn't really clear. And I feel like AAP is quite clear. Um, and there, you know, I was on the website last night feeling really jealous about how much better it is than my website. Um, but I was like, this is so fascinating. I mean, all the different things that art advisors can get involved in. I mean, you know, strategizing museum acquisitions, um, helping out with artist estates, having different departments. I mean, you know, I, I advise for a foundation. Um, we are, we spend, I mean, I agon I feel like I'm the Lorax for artists. I agonize about how to engage artists in different ways and, and rather than just having art auctions and making tons of money. Um, so we've been working really closely with artists, you know, to produce things together and that's been really interesting. Mm. So I feel like as an advisor, there's a lot of potential. Um, I also feel like, you know, it's getting more and more complicated. So, you know, just, just managing collections when they get big enough becomes really kind of not problematic but complex and figuring out how to activate a collector's collection is also part of my job like all right let's see if we can um, get a curator to come in here and look through everything and can we get some like a show pulled out of this and you know what boards do you want to sit on or can I introduce you to this nonprofit um, I co-founded a nonprofit called via uh, art, which basically gives money away to art production. Um, and I got some of my clients involved in that. So I think, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that can be done by a really good advisor. And I think, you know, there's horrible collectors, there's horrible art advisors out there. I don't want to say they're art advisors. I'd like to say they're just runners or, you know, yeah, we're, we're we're back at that again. Yeah. We're, we're going to move on, though. Have you have you either of you as gallerists been you know had any interaction with this new sort of art advisors from a financial institutions which are now getting more into into that role, or the auction houses who are sort of acting as art advisors? Do you do you find that you're getting more involved with them or been approached or not really? No, no not 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 yet, as far as I know, yeah. really. Um, um, and we work. Coming back to art advisors, I mean, we work quite often with a lot of art advisors, and we and a lot of the art advisors, in fact, all the art advisors that uh, we've been working with, have acted very professionally. I think uh, one of the, the the discussion we're having here is is also is what art advisors can contribute, mm -hmm. and they can contribute an awful lot. Uh, but um, the galleries uh, can also contribute an awful lot to the collectors. And it's finding the middle way of mm. correctness. And I, I come back to it again. I don't think it's a silly subject. I think it's a very serious subject that you've got, you know, really people who have no knowledge at all. I mean, if you listen sometimes to the conversations, and I'm sure it's also with art galleries as well, but if you listen to some of the conversations of, of, of um, art advisors to, to a collector, it's, it's, it's pretty mind-boggling. Mm. Um, and uh, it's trying to get a professionalism. I think, you know, we shouldn't be having a discussion here about ourselves, with this is a discussion about the industry, mm. and I think it's very, very important to talk about it and to find ways to make it better. I still hold like it will regulate itself. Again, I mean, anybody who's that dumb, and I've heard, I, I know what you're talking about, just, I mean, then the, the client is really the one that's deciding to hire them, I suppose. Um, but I would think what's more interesting is how can galleries and professional art advisors work together yes. in, a, in a more, I think and, and maybe I can speak to my, my really good mm. um, interactions. Um, so, I mean, there's a number of galleries that I work with where I'll call and talk about the collection and brainstorm. You know, like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And so when I when I bring a collector over, there isn't this animosity of, you're an art advisor. It's like, this is Lisa, okay. Um, and I, that's almost always my experience. Um, thank God. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because I think it would be really embarrassing if it weren't. Um, 
but then we sit down together and I don't pretend to own the conversation about the artist or, you know, I'm always learning as well because it keeps on going, right? So I need to, I just know how to ask the right questions sometimes. Um, but I certainly don't want to be this, you know, buffer between a gallery and a collector at all. And I certainly, again, I think the most important thing is, you know, I don't have a sales quota. Um, and so when someone's pushing on my client, because they do, that's where I'm like, you know, pause for a second. So, so David, just following on from what you were saying, you're talking about um, art advisors and, and artist careers. I mean, how do you think, what, what ways do you think art advisors and galleries can work together t with the goal of promoting a, an artist career and market and everything else? With the how artist you direct, do you mean? Well, how, how do you think a, an art advisor can contribute to what you're doing in terms of building the artist? And well, I career? think uh, two ways. One is that the art, the art gallery business um, has evolved so much and has become so sort of speedy. Uh, sort of when I first started, there was, you know, I mean, <laughs> I remember in, in, in 1973 was the first oil crisis and, uh, um, you know, my, I, I, my mother said, uh, you know, there's nobody coming in, the, the, the collectors are not coming in. I said, but there must be some collectors. She said, but there's only really three collectors in Britain. Now there's hundreds. And, you know, the art business has become, um, I mean, a, a wonderful situation where there's a fantastic amount of collectors. Um, but we, we are not always putting in enough um, research and work for our collectors because we have so many collectors. And so in that way, I think adv art advisors can be helpful because they, they ca can do, if they're doing what you're saying you do, and I know you do it, um, that's great. But uh, just have, a, it's, it's like having a, a, an insurance broker who does so at all. Um, and, and so, I think art advisors can do a lot, but it is a different thing. They are there on one side. The gallerist is there for both sides in a way. Um, b in other words, they're there representing their artists and trying to sell their artist's work. And if they're a good gallery, they should also be there to make sure that the collector gets a good collection and is getting good work. And so we're doing both. Mm. Uh, the auction houses were meant to be <laughs> impartial agents, but now they do all, all of our work. Mm. Uh, they're, they're art advisors, they're art galleries. They represent the collector, uh, the seller, and the buyer. Um, I think the which I obviously don't think is quite right. Um, but I, I do, do honestly think adv art advisors have a, a role to play if they play it efficiently. I think part of the problem, too, is with the expansion. So, you know, there's a couple of young galleries in New York that, you know, when I feel like buying something for myself, I'm like, what are they doing? You know, I keep my eye on them. And I think, you know, a lot of galleries advise. They still do. You know, there, mm. there are collectors out there that just go to a few galleries, and I think that was really the way it used to be. So now it's gotten, there's so much information coming at collectors mm. all day long. It, even to me, I used to be on top of the art, uh, art fairs. Now I, I'm like, I don't care. I just, it's too much. So I think actually it's really hard for a gallery to really build a collection with one person. And the bottom line is the first thing that is coming into a lot of gallerists' minds every day because you've got to do 20 art fairs and all this staff and keep your artists happy. I feel like increasingly galleries are really there for the artists and that's, they need to be, like that's your client. And I feel like increasingly art advisors are needed to help like the 
the collector. Mm. And I think, and, and you talked about sort of the expansion of things, the globalization aspect of the art market. I don't know how you, or I mean, the galleries are one thing as well, how you cope with sort of keeping your, your finger on the pulse of a global art market. And how uh -huh. do you know what's happening in China, what's happening in the Middle East, the galleries, what's happening everywhere else? I, I would just, just like to, to, to come in on that about uh, galleries being there for the artists. They're not uh, there just for the artists, they're there for the collectors. I mean, years ago, um, you know, a collector would have a gallery and they would, you know, even if they saw something in another gallery, they would buy it through, through, through that gallery. Um, still in the Far East, um, you know, th that system does still work. And it, it, it's very good because they build up a relationship, a trust with the gallery. And the gallery, if it's a good gallery, is not going to uh, say, don't buy that from that gallery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I think it's, it's important to, to know that as a gallerist, you're, you're representing artists, but you're also there for the, for the collector. I don't think, I don't think um, uh, you know, when I, uh, I have a number of really good collectors and, you know, I wouldn't sell them something that I didn't think would fit their collection just because I show that artist. I think, actually, that is the conflict and maybe the big change. I think in America, Almost every gallery I would talk to would say, hands down, 100%, their client is the artist, period. That's their priority, bar none. So I think that's shifting. And, and I think maybe that's where art advisors could be more needed. Um, and it's shifting just by nature of doing 20 fairs a year. Or, you know, it's not, it's not every gallery, but I would say the bulk of them. I hate to think you're right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, listen, I, I, I like the old days too of like, just <laughs> sorry, I don't mean it that way, but you know, one gallery, yeah. uh, no internet. I mean, it's great, but it's not, you know, it's, it's really shifting. So, um, I mean, in a weird way, and this is where I hope galleries and, and art advisors can come together and, you know, it's like whether you care or not, but you know, the ability for shit art to sift into this system now, it's so easy because of the way things are moving so fast and the bottom line, right? You know, some of these huge galleries and all of a sudden you see a gallerist that you think is amazing and you see them take on a, a bad artist and you're like, oh my God. Um, so I think protecting content is the hardest thing right now. The galleries are the creators of content, artists are. And the galleries are bringing them together and giving some sort of platform so that we can have a conversation. But if I'm just going to Swizz Beats Instagram art fair, like what's my filter? Like I like it, you know, there, there's, I mean, I feel like I, I'm really fighting for that meaning and maybe, you know, Maybe I'm naive, but I feel like that's where we can really together kind of. But are, are also, aren't you uh, in a prime position in terms of the globalized art world happening? You can flit around and sort of you know connect galleries internationally because you're the sort of uh, you're, you're the agent in some way of, as well, and you can fulfill that role. I don't know if you do or how you manage to do that, but is that something you see? What do you mean connecting? Getting, them? getting, going, seeing what's happening at Hong Kong Art Fair, oh seeing yeah. what's happening there. I mean, sort of you know, connecting internationally, connecting galleries internationally with collectors who are in the States or oh, wherever yeah. they are. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like a lot of times I look to curators to see what they're working on to kind of get the international, because I want to, I don't want to discover artists and I don't want to make artists. It's not what I do. I want to see that they've been pulled through the system in a way that I feel like, okay, I'm, I want to pay attention now. Um, it's not to say I wouldn't buy somebody who didn't, but it's not really... You know, uh, sometimes artists seek me out to mm. do stuff like that, and I have no interest. It's not my job, and I wouldn't do a good job at it. And by the way, I think galleries have the absolute 100% hardest position um, of all. It is so expensive and difficult to run a gallery. I mean, it's unbelievable everything that you have to do to, like, just, you know, have these relationships. And from what I understand, dealing with the artists is not easy at all either. Um, 
so I, I do want to make clear, like, I think it's incredibly important. And so if we can, you know, work together to defend that, I'd be really happy. Great. Okay, on that note of coming together, <laughs> uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Of course, I traditionally as a gallery have some objections, but the main thing is that I think uh, there is the comparison between uh, the enormous cost and investment the gallery makes and comparable to that, the art advisor, he can go around anywhere and I, for the first time in my life, started to Google somebody. So Lisa, as I, as I know you from 15 years ago, my memory is not that strong, but I know that we met uh, I googled you, and you s and and it says that you work with galleries and with artists, and I think this already for me poses a great contradiction, because to go directly to the artist, this is what galleries and the work of galleries should prevent. I I see, and I also saw. But what do you what? Do, wait, wait, wait. Here's how I work with artists. Okay. Andrea Bowers. I just produced a neon work with her. I went to Andrew Kreps. We came together, we did an amazing project. We put her on the outside of the Perez Art Museum and gave her a show together. I'm not like, and that was. I know Jorgen showed me it. No, no, I did not know, I did not mean the cooperation with galleries, but from your website it says that you work directly with artists. It doesn't say it, I mean, you'll have to show me, but by directly with artists, I don't buy from artist studios or have Super, any. Super, because I think this, this is. That. Because I think this is what many of your colleagues do, and this is what one of the reasons that many galleries have a problem with art advisors. Buying from the studio? Well, first of all, you should be worried about the artist if they're selling from the studio. Second absolutely, of all, absolutely one on of the reasons side. I don't do that, and I'll let you finish, but just want to say, one of the reasons I don't like that is because then there's no context. There's no show, there's no exhibition Perfect. history, and galleries should stop taking things made for art fairs. You should make sure it goes into a show first. Sorry. Absolutely. I agree completely. And um, this is uh, what I wanted to find out. I also saw that you work uh, with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. And he just um, gave a gift of uh, one of my former artists to the museum in Los Angeles. And um, <coughs> John Gerard. And uh, there's somebody that we really built up for over 10 years, and like five year, five weeks before the Biennale, he said uh, he wants other representatives, which happens all the and time. And how do you think he knows who John Gerard is? Probably through you, but A I mean... A good art advisor. <laughs> it's true, but where did you see his work? John Gerard? Yeah. I helped produce the piece at Lincoln Center through the nonprofit. So, but that, that I was uh, uh, already his new gallery, right? Um, Thomas Dane. Thomas Dane, yeah. yes. Yeah, super. So I think, thank you very much, but that was, I wanted to make that clear, that because really many art advisors go to the studios and this is what, one of the great problems for galleries because we spend a lot of money building up artists and then immediately they go uh, and... Uh, I mean, I would say also, I mean, I worked really hard to get that donation at LACMA and yeah. now I'm fundraising, if anybody wants to give me $200,000 to <laughs> produce the John Gerard outside of LACMA. Ah. So we're working on that now. So we're it's not okay. all bad, but I understand. I, you I understand do. understand them. Okay, thank you. That's it's a hard crowd, Lisa. It's, it's not okay. easy. <laughs> no, it's, it's, they're all good issues. They and I think, actually, you know, exactly. another problem that you're bringing exactly. up is what to do when artists sell from the studio. You know, it, it's not like art advisors are going in like, sell me something from the studio. Oh, that's, that's another thing. Yeah. yeah. And back there. Hi. Hi. Hello? I, I cannot Hi. really believe. Just wait. Oh, sorry. You want to go on? No, you first. Hello. Who's first? No. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I'm, I'm working for an art fair for Art Brussels, and I was wondering just um, if there's uh, if a fair can play a role in that, in, in the sense that um, um, many collectors, art advisors, uh, are uh, invited to come and visit a fair. But uh, you were saying that uh, it's difficult to have um, like uh, uh, some sort of regulation. Is there, is there a way that a fair can help in that? And for example, like there, like there are press badges. Is there something that, that we can do uh, working together with fairs to say from this is really like a acknowledgeable uh, art advisor? I mean, I, I find that offensive I somehow. Like who's, I mean, I think it 
because we're not talking about finances. You know, we're, I mean, that is a role I play. But, you know, if you want me to take a Series 7 exam, I will. But if, I mean, I'm very snotty about education, so I just find it like, you know, it will sort itself out. But if you want to give me a badge, I'm happy. I mean, I have, <laughs> I have issues with the one organization that does exist because I don't, I've, that's a longer story. We have to go in there, there. But I, I, I think it self-regulates. But, but I, I think it's an interesting question because I think the art fairs like Basel are starting to become sort of regulatory because they have this code of conduct for with galleries now, don't they? They set out. So maybe that will extend to the entire industry. Yeah, maybe the they're the regulators. The volume of business I do at art fairs should, you know, is good. Speak for itself. Yeah. I, I, I think what you're asking, um, basically galleries have, when they sign agreements partic with art fairs, on most art fairs have conditions that they have to meet, which may be that the work should be an original, that it's not a fake, that it's not stolen, uh, that, that you're paying your artists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you're asking whether um, art advisors, who after all are a business, who come into the fairs, should be regulated in that way. And um, I'm very much in your favor of not regulating everything. But it's not an uninteresting subject to, to, to follow up because, uh, you know, if a photographer goes into an art fair, he signs forms what he's allowed to do and what he's not allowed to do. Should advisors have to sign a form of what they're allowed to do and what but they're what not allowed to do? But what am I allowed not to allowed do? to do? A, I so mean, I feel like an advisor is as good as their clients. If I don't have a good client, I suck. Now... To but get that's the same for me as a gallery. Right. But to get a good uh, you client, know, I have exactly to have a It's exactly the same, but I sign a form. You don't. <laughs> well, don't sell to me then. I mean, Sorry? Is, isn't it that simple? Don't sell me anything. No, no, fair. no, that's not, not the question. The, the, the question she's asking is, should there be some kind of regulation? How, though? In? I mean, I feel like... I'm not like quite sure how you do it. I, I, yeah, I just uh, wanted to... my question, which is going in this direction? Yeah. Let's hear, let's hear. I'm a little bit embarrassed, first of all, to defend art advisors because sometimes <laughs> I, I'm surprised doing this, but I'm really surprised to see galleries, you know, going at a good professional because she's one of the good ones. Uh, you know, kind of stigmatizing the whole profession through her. I so what we have to be careful. I so let me, let me just add that. a question. Let me just set a question because first of all, there is one problem is I, re I remember a very major Belgian collector when he started his career, he said, you know, I don't understand why those galleries are not considering me because I'm really ready to buy things. But in a way, we as a collector, now we need to market ourselves to kind of get access to the right work. Okay, that's one of the problems. That's why we would need an art advisor because you want to get in the business, you have the 100,000 to buy it, but you would not have access to that, to that work, for example. Second class, why did you give um, 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 uh, a reserve to this uh, art advisor in Art Miami? Because it's your choice. Because we've been working with them. It for doesn't a matter. I mean, if you do it, it is your choice. Um, so you don't have to. And it's the same with the profession. You can speak about yourself. You're asking yeah, them. It was a mistake. And, but I, I'm talking about this. And mistake. that's the thing, you know, because you. This mistake came, came about by, the, by this uh, role that the. The but it's your choice. So, so I, I have another example, live example. I have a gallerist asking me, um, you know, a smaller gallery in, in Mako a few years ago. They tell me, Alain, what should I do? I have this woman coming with a group of, of Mexican collector. Um, eventually, they start discussing. One of them buys something from, from, uh, from the gallery. And the woman comes back 10 minutes later and asking for a, a commission. What should I do? She's asking me. Then I'm telling her, you know, it's very simple. Did she come to you, visit the booth before, to check out what, what there was on the booth and saying, I want to present this work, for example? Or was she just walking around randomly? First. Second, did she have a business card showing that she was an art advisor? Because I'm not even sure that the people she was working with knew that she would uh, get a commission by showing them around. Uh, and again, and I said, so I don't think you should pay her a commission because she had no business card and she didn't come in advance. The galleries then told me, yeah, but, you know, 
I don't know. I, uh, maybe it's better because maybe it will bring. Maybe it will bring me more business. Maybe this business, uh, this art advisor you accepted, will bring you business at so at some point. You are free to to do it. And when you're talking about regulation, I'm a little bit embarrassed as well because I'm the one pushing galleries to imp to get better at best practices. And 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 I'm not and, talking and about regulation. I'm talking. No, no. About best practices. I'm fighting for you to have best practices in terms of contract with the artist, you know, paying the artist, even asking us collectors to sign you something when we buy something and just shaking hands and 10% of us don't pay you. I think I'm in, in favor. So now you want to impose this to uh, art advisors. I think it's a little bit harsh because of course it's, it's nasty. The, the art world is just a jungle right now on all sides, but why to, to go for, for them? You could go for art critic, you could go for, for art advisors. But can, can, I, can I step in? I, I, don't, I don't know if it's uh, going with, for no, them. I in a way, I think I it, it I can happen. I have to just say, um, <laughs> and I, I quite uh, object to what you're saying mm. about, go about going uh, um, for art advisors. I'm, I have said here very much that I'm very much in favor of what of professional art advisors. What I think we were discussing is unprofessional, probably not real art advisors. Uh, we're talking about people who take a wedge, which is something very different. There are unprofessional galleries as well. But I certainly take objection to saying that, I, we, that we, we as gallerists, because that's creating an atmosphere here on the stage that we are having a go mm. at art advisors. What we're trying to discuss here is professionalism mm -hmm. and um, where art advisors can contribute, which they can. Um, just, just to clarify as well, I mean, Lisa, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be helpful? You, you complain about it yourself. There's a massive art advisors who just stand up. Oh, it's embarrassing. Yeah. Exactly, but wouldn't that help you as a professional, as a proper professional, to have I don't different? Even or like it's for just me, reputation. this conversation is like. I mean, it probably isn't, but it's silly. It's just like there are Good stupid and people, and there are really smart people, and you know, it's more interesting to talk about what we can do instead of like how do you get rid of the dumb. I mean, it's cro they're crooks. They, they will they will burn out on their own. I mean, it, you know, like galleries know exactly who they are. Uh, you know, you might get burned one time, but it's it's also a lot of it's coming from the collectors too. So, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, how many collectors have you met that made money on a on a work of art quickly and suddenly they're dealers? It's, it's you know, so there's all kinds of bad behavior, but that's not so interesting. I think it's really interesting to talk about art defending art, what we all love, why we're all here. I think there's a lot at stake right now. I think artists, the power sh is shifting all over and it's unclear. And just to give one more example, you know, when working with an artist, was working with an artist for an art auction. So I did Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation auction Sancho Pay last year. I worked really, really hard to get Linda Bangless, um, you know, Yinka Shoni Bare, Sean Scully, like people from every, I didn't want to do just Jeff Koons, Mark Grosjean, you know, and I put Andrea Bowers in there. I did the best I could to make this um, exhibition. And one of the things I really wanted was a Lawrence Wiener. And I, you know, this is something you just, I knew which galleries would not allow me to talk to Lawrence and which ones would be fine. So Tadeus Ropach, who was super generous, who um, I sort of fell in love with last year after he gave his, his keynote uh, speech, brought me to his studio, and we had this most incredible interaction. The work was purchased at the auction by Len Blavatnik. Now we're working on putting it in the pool at the Sunset Tower Hotel and launching a series of conversations about art and the environment. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is because I think we all just have to let go. Like, art advisors can't some like cling to their clients. You can't talk to my client. I control them. You know, artists are in some cases doing whatever they want and selling out of the studio, which I completely agree with is really, really problematic or playing gallerists by like sneaking around to other galleries. Um, you know, I watch that stuff and I'm like, that's making me nervous. You know, like what does that mean for my my collectors and that artist's work. So I really do think that we all need each other. Like, ecosystem is really changing so fast, it's kind of terrifying. You wonder, am I gonna have a job next year? Um, but I do think there are, are just ways to carve out 
um, a space for everybody. And I, I just think focusing on regulation is like building a wall around Mexico. You know, it's just like, like I, I mean, if the criteria is a master's from Christie's, and no offense to anybody who has a master's from Christie's, like, then, you know, fine. I just, I feel like it's a bit silly. Um, questions? My question, I don't know, it's not working. Ah. Is this, uh, uh, shall I ask or shall I? Wait, let, no, let him, let him go first, thanks. Yeah. Go ahead. So, at the beginning, Lisa said that art knowledge, art history knowledge is prerequisite. But as the longer I he I'm hearing you, the more confused I get. I think that, uh, well, the question is, what is more important then, art history, art knowledge, or Things like integrity, common sense, professional attitude, and good taste. Why is that an or? Mm -hmm. I mean, why why are those mutually because, exclusive? Because, well, no, but I, when I uh, art something like art history can be learned, but attitudes cannot. Be. Exactly. So how are you going to regulate integrity? Because I think integrity is the thing we need more than anything everywhere in the world. If you were to hire somebody, for example. They have a limited art knowledge, but they are well, of he or she is good peop good person. I yeah, mean, I mean uh, with integrity, with professional attitude, <laughs> someone ha who can who can be taught. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what the question. You can is. ask. You can equally ask the, the question galleries is, what as is, well. What the same is question. <laughs> yeah. I think you have to have both. Okay. Okay. Sorry that. Yeah, Your question. I just wanted to get back um, uh, to the remark that uh, Alain made, and he was um, suggesting you. that this art advisor that, that turned up at the gallery afterwards to uh, ask for a commission, and that there would be a distinction whether this art advisor had a business card or had uh, shown up before. I think the mess starts as soon as art advisors are paid by the galleries, and galleries simply should not pay art advisors, and the art advisors should be paid by their clients, by the collectors, and this would be a, a clear picture because, as you said, uh, in the beginning, taking commissions from both sides is criminal. Agreed. I agree. What I'm paid by my clients. <coughs> Gallerists, what do, you, what do you feel about that? Anybody, I mean, that's just silly. If somebody came mm. back, it's clear that the people don't know she's taking a commission and she's just, you know, that's just ridiculous. I wouldn't do it if I were the gallery. Hi, um, I agree with Lisa that this conversation is really silly in a way because um, it's pretty obvious to me as a gallerist that you have a very small number of extremely professional, extremely reputable art advisors of which Lisa is one and those are the ones I deal with. I don't even answer the emails of the other ones just like I don't answer the emails of like crap clients and it's that simple. You're not going to tell me who your client is? Don't email me then. Like, I'm not going to sell to you. Yeah. Um, and if you're the kind of gallery that will sell anyway because you're desperate, then that's the way you run your business. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that I wanted to bring up was this idea of how art advisors and galleries can work together. Um, something that Lisa said I think is very prevalent in art advisory, which is this idea of like working with artists that have been pulled through a system and I appreciate that a lot of clients have that concern for um, a certain type of validation or a certain like market level before they will purchase something and they employ often advisors to act as that buffer. But I find that um, problematic for younger galleries because the system is rigged. Like I can be showing an artist who the advisor will have no interest in and then as soon as it's picked up by a blue chip, like the advisor's on the back of that artist and I think one thing that maybe advisors could think about more of how to support this whole ecosystem is to have a different attitude to younger galleries. And like, sure, maybe, and I know people are very like time constrained, especially the clients, but I think that there could be more of a look at um, not only an art historical conversation, but a very contemporaneous um, current dialogue 
uh, research. Mm. So maybe art advisors could bring their clients more and like show them younger artists and mm. bring them to younger galleries. Because what I find with art advisors is even the excellent ones that I work with are only interested in my artists that sell above 50,000. And I find that extremely frustrating. Yeah. But that's, again, I, I mean, I live for young art. I mean, if I had all the time in the world and a lot of money from my family or something, then I would just focus on, on that. Um, I spend a lot of time though, and a lot of resources to keeping my finger on the pulse. In fact, I've, uh, sometimes I'm sad that I've been known for the younger emerging artists, but I'm always going to young galleries. And by the way, at that point, you shouldn't have an artist who's $50,000. I'm, I just sat down with somebody in New York and said $25,000 is too much to, to put on this artist. It's too expensive because a very emerging artist. <coughs> and he said, I have no choice. Uh, the artist has to pay her graduate sc uh, school bills and I have to pay for the art fair. So I don't, again, like it's not so much a, an art advisor problem about ignoring young galleries. And it is a collector problem of people who are not really collecting but just buying and looking for the right investment. And quite frankly, I would never waste my time doing that. I get excited about art. I mean, why are we all doing this, right? I mean, Thanks. we love art. I just bought a painting from a studio of an artist who has no money right now. And he needed some support. And you know, I don't know what's gonna happen with his career. I don't care, but he, was so grateful and wrote me the sweetest note, like you really gave me hope. So I'm there for the ecosystem. You know, I really am. David. Um, I, I would also answer that. I think that uh, <laughs> gallerists, and I know Klaus and certainly ourselves, uh, although we need to sell expensive pictures because we have uh, vast overheads and so on, but we have a lot, a lot of young artists. I mean, my next exhibition, uh, one artist who's pretty established, um, and the works are all under four thousand pounds, every single one, you know. And I think it is very important to be doing things for what you believe in. I mean, it's exactly why we're in this business, is because we love it. At least I hope that's the reason that people are in the business. And I think uh, first and foremost comes the art and the beauty of it. And, and, and in that way, we should all be the same. But there are a lot of people in our business today that are only in it for um, money, prestige, and so on. And that, that is causing a lot of problems. It's so boring, actually. Like, in fact, now if there's, you know, you like an art, I mean, how many times this has happened where I've loved a young artist and I've gone there with my clients and then all of a sudden they explode and it's not interesting anymore. Or if there is hype around an artist, I'm like, let's wait. It's, the noise is too big. It becomes about something else. Suddenly you just see a dollar sign and you can't really see the art. Mm. And I feel like, you know, that's never a good sign. It's not good for the artist. It sucks for the gallery, you know, it, and it's, it's not interesting. It's really boring. Melody? Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I just wondered if, to, partly to address Vanessa's question, which is that you know, if you're an art advisor and you're working on a commission, which is a percentage of the work that your client buys, of course you've got no interest in showing work under 50,000. Equally, if you're just in it to make a quick buck and you see people can make millions out of one transaction, you might go in and do something unprofessional just for that, so who cares? I made five million, but I'll never work again, but that's okay. I agree it's difficult to regulate, but could we have something uh, internally that says, okay, a good art advisor only charges a retainer. I Advisors promise don't you have it, it regulates itself. If I'm just like, I'm going to sell, you know, if I want to make $200,000 on a commission sale, then I'm selling, I mean, actually, I... I'm not going to disclose my fees, but they're quite low, so that would be a big number for me. But <laughs> it's not like I can be like I'm. It, I can s make that sale all the time. If I'm forcing a sale, it is so obvious that I'm just trying to make a commission. Then I'm a dealing. What happens is, if that's the way you're operating, if you're operating to make a buck, 
you're a dealer. You're not going to have regular clients. You know, you can't sell. I mean, I have, I work with a lot of collectors who start from ground zero. And so it takes them a while, whether they have the money or not, to even get comfortable to spend that kind of money. So, I mean, it can take five to 10 years. And I love those people. That's fine. You get to grow with them. So I honestly believe you can set up rules and say you have to take retainer. I, I beg people to put me on retainer, but they don't want to. They Or just to have some clarity. Mm. So but the, cl as, uh, the clarity do, is... Do your, your clients all know how you're remunerated. They and see every so single thing. That should thing. somehow yeah. be out there that anyone who takes on an art advisor exactly. should know. Exactly. You're a moron if you don't look at at everything, at every part of the transaction. Um, you know, there. so typically with commission, you can say, have the gallery bill you directly, or I attach the bill with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and also all the work we do to earn that commission, it doesn't stop with like, here, you know, let's buy this. It's shipping, it's installation, it's conservation, it's insurance. It goes on and on and on. So, you know, I really think that you're not, you're, you're not really advising if you don't have a small stable of regular collectors and you will not have that stable if you're behaving the way that you're seeing. Those people might say they're advisors, but they're just dealing. Sorry. Mm. Um, yeah, oh, you got the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is a question for Lisa. I was here last year, um, and I remember you talking about how you appreciate and value a work of art, and you gave a few criteria for this. Um, I only remember one, and I'm, I'm asking you to uh, probably um, tell us uh, all of them. There was one which was this historical value of the work, or you wanted it to somehow reflect uh, the times that we're living? I have three criteria that I kind of ask myself. You know, is it visually and conceptually compelling? Number one. Number two, does it have historical relevancy? And three, is it strategically placed? I.e., it's not my job to be a curator, although sometimes I do that, um, to be a gallery. I'm not, I'm not the one creating the context. So I don't, sometimes I might pick someone who's at ground zero, but I prefer to sort of, it's hard to know whether an artist is historically relevant until there's enough shows happening that I can really understand what's going on. I mean, the most fun is to look at what's happening in the world. I mean, the best art will reveal to us what we, what's right in front of us, but we can't see clearly. You know, it is the truth. And so looking at what's happening around the world with social media and, you know, just kind of trying to look at artists that are addressing things and how are they addressing things? Or is it just art that looks like art? You know, am I just making some more process-based abstraction? Not that that's bad, but you know, that, that was like a thing. But anyway, so those three things I try to think about, um, you know, history, I'm sure there's some PhD students in here who would say <coughs> there is no history. We, I mean, I don't want to get theoretical, but I do think it's important that it is participating in a conversation, not just about what's happening formally with art, but in the world around us. Right, so a question in the back. Yeah, uh, hello. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say that I'm also a little bit confused, Lisa, because um, we all know that we, we want to, uh, to educate collectors. <coughs> we all know that there, is, there will be more young galleries, and there will be more young art advisors. So if, if, of course, we all don't want to work with people who don't want to have good, co do good uh, conduct, but if we don't all work to educate them, and I think that galleries has their job, but as you are a really famous art advisor, everybody knows how you work, but if you say that you don't want to be involved in education of, of other art advisors, who will do it? Um... I don't, I mean, I don't have a, pr I, listen, when people call me to meet for coffee and talk about art, which they do all the time, and being an advisor, I'm, all, my door is always open. Um, I just also have a five-year-old son, and I'm really busy. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm not not interested in it. I just, I find the conversation, s or maybe just in the context of this talk, a little bit off 
what we could be talking about, if that makes sense. I mean, I hate to give airtime to the kind of crap behavior that goes on in the art world, and I'm sorry that it does come a lot from art advisors or people pretending to be art advisors, um, but it also comes from collectors and all kinds of people, so. Adam, do you have a question back? Oh, I sure do, thanks. This yeah. is actually for David and for Klaus because we're here talking galleries. <laughs> um, we represent about 30 artists, uh, some exclusively, some non-exclusively. But you know, over the course of the last 25 years, I've also developed some very, very close relationships with collectors. And they constantly come to me to have me help them build their collection, both by things that are in the gallery and things that are outside of the gallery. And I am more than happy to do this because I really believe in them. We have a long relationship and the whole business is based on relationships. And even in certain instances, I'll be asked to do their due diligence and bid for them and advise them on things that come up at auction. And I will charge them a fee of 10% of what the hammer price is. And they know exactly what it is. They get the bill from the auction house. I put my bill on top. Do you find this a conflict of interest in terms of the role of the gallery and the dealer when it comes to working with collectors? Absolutely not. It's part, it's certainly, uh, certainly part of the work that we do. One of the many services that we do from taking care of, the, I mean, usually one would say you take care of the uh, artist's work from the studio door. That's when the gallery takes over, but the, the, this whole process of running a gallery certainly includes what you just described. Thank I you. Agree. I think some of the best collections in the world historically have been built by the gallery dealer relationship as well as through advisors. I mean, you know, the Havermeyers were so lucky in the turn of the century to have Mary Cassatt advising them, um, and she was an artist. So I think things have changed enormously and we're all good at doing a lot of things and I think that there is ground changing and uh, we I should all do what we do best. And I just want to make one comment to Adam Chefdog, who is one of my best friends who I met in the art world. And one thing that's really valuable for me as an advisor, I mean, is finding really even smarter people than me, finding which, it just never it's happens. Difficult. That's difficult. hard. So yeah. hard. So hard. <laughs> but, you know, finding people that are really smart and have integrity and are personable that I can, bur like, there's nothing more impressive. Like, if I'm having, if I'm like, it's day one with a collector, I'm like, I'm going to Sheffer. Because he, I just know, like, he is going to take us through the whole program. So I think, like, that kind of generosity in certain galleries has been really helpful also as an advisor, which I appreciate very much. Thank you, likewise. Um, right in back and then Martin. Yeah. Um, so I guess addressing the question really, so I'm running a small gallery, so an emerging gallery or this dreaded mid-level, but I'm also sort of quite complex about how the, yeah, what the role then is of the art advisor and how, yeah, in terms of how should they work together, what I guess the question I'm trying to ask is in terms of value adding or what is the art advisor bringing because it seems only to be at the very high level and unfortunately my own experience has been more of the, yeah, I guess the cowboys that are just looking for sales and selling to their, their rich associates rather than actually, yeah, doing any homework. So, yeah, I guess for a younger gallery, does it make sense to, to work with an art advisor and how, how should they work together? I think actually that's a really good question and you know I have now staff underneath me that probably does more of the young art than I do now um, but I try to I really try my hardest to to stay in the game and one thing I do is I ask artists all the time what galleries they like and what artists they are looking at I look at curators um, so as a young gallery, the hard thing is you're, you're at ground zero. So like I, the only way I can recommend something from your gallery is for me to really sit down and spend time with you and go through the whole program. And I try to do that whenever I can, and I should do it more because it is important to 
you, you know, keep it all, all going together. Um, so I don't know that, I don't, I guess, like, I don't know that any gallery needs to seek out an advisor. I think there's lots of people who don't need one. Um, it's really a time issue, I think. You know, f one of the things, I think, you know, all my clients perfectly are educated and could, if they put the time in, could do this themselves. It's just they're busy, they have busy lives. So what I can do with a young gallery is not so much say, oh, this artist or that artist, because it's still so new. It's just, let's go, like, let's get out there. Send them to come see you. Um, you know, I don't feel like I have to, like my, I want my clients to go look at art all day long. I don't want them to wait for me to come. And that is trust. If I can't do that with my client, if I'm worried they're gonna buy around me, then that is not an advisory, right? So I think that's also the issue. If, if people are holding on tight, you know, then I think that's problematic. If someone doesn't wanna work with me, then they shouldn't, you know? If they're not gonna have, like I'm a partner, I'm not, I'm not someone trying to sell things to you, but I'm really just a sounding board to help make good decisions. Sorry. <laughs> don't be, young don't artists, apologize. Young galleries are... Are good. Martin. Uh, I guess uh, one of the things that I'm a bit confused about still is how we haven't really talked about holding also collectors accountable and the ways in which, in, in my experience, advisors help me with that. Uh, as you know, someone working in a medium-sized gallery, I can give examples of not only bad advisors but also bad collectors. Um, and advisors, in some way, facilitate um, holding them accountable. Um, and maybe Lisa, you can shed some light into this, especially with um, I would say a new class of collector coming in, whether it, uh, it's a collector from the tech industry or that traditionally hasn't purchased artwork before but also collectors from, say, uh, non-collecting regions, say, in uh, Southeast Asia or uh, other examples. What do you mean by holding accountable? Um, particularly when it comes to payment, when it comes to oh, renegotiating the terms of a sale. Uh, I have ex experienced many times people coming back and saying, actually, I really don't want 10%. I want 15%. Or I don't work with anybody like that. Yeah. But so I'm sure there are, I mean, Sometimes I wish I were a tougher negotiator. You know, there's someone in our industry who's quite tough. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't work with someone who, I mean, if that's quite problematic and it would become problematic for all my clients if mm -hmm. someone's behaving that way. But listen, I certainly have had clients that have behaved badly and I am, you know, I, I, take, I take the blame. Mm -hmm. I do it. So it's part of my job. A little bit. And that problem is the same for everybody, I think. I mean, it's obviously yeah. not only for, for an advisor, but also for the galleries or any... Auction house, even. Yes, uh, yes exactly. Um, right. Um, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. One more question back there. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is going to David and Klaus. I would really like to know, I mean, if an art advisor comes to your gallery with a secure sale, let's say, and I think I imagine they mostly take maybe 10% or go up to 15%, so as you typically take 50-50 with an artist, you could just get down your cut 50-40% or even split it with the artist, do 45-45. So why would you have such a resistance to an art advisor who's coming to you to sell, to give you a sale, basically? I don't think I am resistant, firstly. I think it is very important that the collector is aware of the situation, and that's up to the advisor. Um, I don't think I approve of basically giving a backhander, but there's no reason why you shouldn't give a commission to somebody who's doing a job. And what I was talking about were the people who were not doing their jobs. Obviously, you know, this is an organization that really works well and is doing all the work, which involves a lot of other things, such as arranging the shipping and, and insurance and, and advising the clients. And these are really quite complex at times. Uh, but I have, no, I have no problem in paying a commission as long as it's up front and it's understood. 
I also think there's, I just thought of a horrible advisor situation where I think I've heard of advisors buying for one client, but really it's not going to that client. So I think knowing who the buyer is, is, is an issue with some bad advising. And Klaus, what would be your response? No, I, I agree. Transparency is the b basic uh, yeah. ground for all of this. And, and if it's not transparent, step away. Yeah. Right, I, I'm going to take the last question. I'm going to give you a little bit of a rest, Lisa. I'm not going to shut up. Because you you you've been working very hard. Uh, but the, our two gallerists, if in a perfect world, what would you, uh, in terms of an art advisor and their role, what would you what would you want from an art advisor in terms of what would make your lives better, happier, easier, um, in terms of the role that the art advisor could play in, in the sort of transactions that you encounter? I think it's relatively simple. In, in, a, in an ideal world, you, you want an art advisor who comes with a collector who isn't already your own collector um, and is somebody new and fresh and who trusts the, per the art advisor and has been given proper information, actually basically what you have been saying, um, and is contributing towards my gallery in making a, a sale to a collector, to a good collector, um, it's pretty straightforward and simple. Mm. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Mm. I mean, we, we yesterday also talked about, this, we use the word collector uh, in general yeah. for people who, who buy art. And I think we should really s uh, start distinguishing between the, the, the collector, the uh, occasional buyer, and the regular buyer. And these are certainly three different kinds of, of, of entities in, uh, or uh, actors in the, in the art world. Uh, um, and w what we, I mean... The you the forgot I investors. What? You forgot investors. Yes, <laughs> yes. That's true. <laughs> 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 and, and, uh, and, of course, the... Art advisor. Uh, I mean, the the role of the gallery used to be the role of the art, uh, but in a in a in a bigger world, in a bigger art world, mm. I see the point of having people specialized in uh, in advising people who who don't feel that they have time to spend like the old collector used to do. Uh, but um, I think it's very, very important to distinguish between these groups. And uh, at some point, I, I don't think a collector in my terms uh, would talk to an art advisor as much as they would talk to a, a gallery or possibly an auction house. But as time goes, I'm sure that this is also uh, the role of uh, to really to advise good collectors. <coughs> okay, I know I'm not supposed to talk, but you make a really <coughs> good point. And let's get let's let's criticize the media and the art fairs a little bit because I think part of the problem is, you know, it, it, because so many people only experience art through art fairs now, which really upsets me. Um, I would beg them, don't go to the fair. Let's, let's give me a day in New York and we'll go to galleries. But they go. And so now they're seeing your gallery and your gallery in this trade show. And it's really, there's no, th it's hard to see the content, right? I know you guys work hard to present it that way and I appreciate when it's done really well at a fair, but you know, it's not ideal. And that's where really, how, how can you even know what you're looking at? You know, I mean, I, I get that, like you know, great art should jump out at you, but when it's like a whole, you know, building full of it, it's a little tricky. So let's blame the art fairs and then the media. Basically, like you know, I feel like all the stories are about how great the art market is. Nobody ever asks about the art. It's the market, the market, the market, and that is part of the problem. We are creating monsters. Yes, fake news. Fake news. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> on that note, I, I just want to say thank you. for. We, it's been a very honest and a very interesting discussion. And Lisa, I think you've been very good about... I'm going to uh, win these guys over. I'm going to become <laughs> their best client. It's starting client. to happen. <laughs> but Lisa, you, I think you, you've been very honest about the role, which is very interesting. And as well, you've, you've actually had to uh, defend uh, you know, a profession that does have its good, good folks in it and, and not so good. But the, um, I think, you know, like everything in the art world, the, the cream rises to the top and you are at the top. But thank you very much, panel, for a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>